Roger, so good to get to talk to you today. Hey, it's my pleasure, my friend. You had an amazing mother growing up. What are some of the biggest lessons you learned from her, and how did you learn them? Well, it's maybe just by osmosis. Uh, yeah, she 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 was uh, an awesome, awesome uh, lady. Uh, but I think the most striking thing about um, how I learned is is she would answer almost no question. Uh, so the, uh, if you asked her a question, she would typically ask a question back. So, so for example, you know, if I'd asked her mom, you know, have you seen my, I used to play with Tonka, those little metal Tonka trucks. Um, you know, have you seen my, you know, blue Tonka truck? And instead of her answering, she would say, well, Roger, what's the last time you are absolutely sure that you can remember holding it in your hand? Uh, and then I'd, I'd think a whole lot about it. And, too, and then she'd say, well, uh, why don't you go to where you were when you last can remember having held it in your hand? Uh, and, uh, and sure enough, it, you know, it would, it would be there, but she didn't say, check your bedroom or check this. She would, she would always be, a return return fire with a with a question so she taught me that you kind of have to think your way uh, out of things and and uh, you have the power uh, to do that and that may seem fairly simple but as a four or five year old it's, a, it's sort of a powerful lesson it's something that we're we're missing today in a lot of ways don't you think yes i i think so i mean i think the education system you know has got a fundamental uh, assumption that the job is to you know unzip the top of your head and pour pour knowledge in rather than to teach you how to think um now i i, I there are awesome teachers uh, and we work with a whole lot of awesome teachers in our uh, our uh, i think uh, program uh for example who i think are attempting uh, to teach the students how to think, but there's just too much of it that is, is pouring in knowledge and assuming that that is, that somehow makes you more effective. And as the former Dean of the Rockland <laughs> school, you're, you're in a position to know that you, you oversaw some of the most significant changes there in, in a long time. Um, what would you say is wrong with sort of like business and education specifically? Well, I, yeah, that one, unfortunately there's a big, big problem. And, uh, uh, it, and it's that business schools do not teach the fundamental problems of business. I mean, that's that's pretty bad, right? Uh, what they teach are finance, what they teach is marketing, uh, they teach is HR. And as the great greatest management thinker of all time, Peter Drucker said, there are no marketing problems, there are no finance problems, there are no accounting problems, there are only business problems. And these are problems that that span across sloppily span across a bunch of, uh, domains, uh, and, and business education has abdicated. It doesn't even try to, uh, to teach how you think across domains. And, and that's, that's really problematic. And, and it's consistent with, with a lot of the huge problems, uh, in the world, uh, is, is thinking that you can, decompose uh, things into into little pieces and, and somehow add them up together and they'll add up to the whole that you wish uh, does, doesn't happen and, and business education is, is a critical impediment to that uh, as it currently stands. So is it right to say that part of teaching people to think better is trying to connect, teach them that everything is connected to everything else in the world? Yes, it is. Uh, and, and that's, that's a more daunting task. So like, I understand why business education abdicates that that's a, that's a more daunting, uh, task and things are less easy to prove, right? It's much easier to prove as, as you would well know, Shane, right? It, uh, you've heard the guys all else being equal, this causes that, right? And, and you, and you, and you know, all those other things that you have to assume are, are equal are not. Um, but if you do hold them, uh, all constant, then you can develop, 
uh, and prove a causal relationship between two things. So it's sort of easier to write a paper, do a study, all of those things, if you uh, take a narrow, narrow lens. Uh, but that's just not helpful to the world. And and so, you know, I, I think uh, business education uh, draws in lots of people who would have succeeded without it. <laughs> uh, th they're the ones that small percentage of people who can integrate, who just learned, learned early on in their life, one way or another, long before they got to business school, how to think integratively. Uh, then they go to business school, then they go out and think integratively, despite what business uh, school taught them. And then the business school says, see, see, like we made that person. Right. And, uh, and I just, I just don't think that's the, that's the case. Where should that start that integrative sort of teaching and what should it look like? You, you sound, you strike me as somebody who's thought about this a lot more than the average person. <laughs> I think I have. And, uh, uh, and I've been taught things that I didn't, I for sure didn't expect or, or understand. So, so as, as you may, may know, I introduced this concept of integrative thinking. I wrote a book on it and introduced the concept uh, of it to, uh, to business education, to the Rotman school. Uh, and I had a student, a wonderful student by the name of Eli Avishai, uh, who came from an unusual background primary education. She was a school teacher before coming and doing an, an MBA. She loved integrative thinking and, and said to me uh, uh, as she was graduating, hey, Roger, I think you can teach this to younger people than MBAs. And I said, OK, uh, let's see. And and we arranged through a, through a friendly, friendly person to test it out at uh, a, a girls uh, high school, an all girls uh, high school called Branksome Hall. Uh, and, uh, and it was spectacularly successful. And it was an eye opener to me because these, these, uh, girls who were, uh, grade 10 girls, uh, so they had definitively six fewer years of formal education, right? Grade uh, 11, grade 12, four years of, of undergrad compared to our MBAs and our MBAs on average have about four and a half years of work experience. So they have 10 and a half less, yeah, fewer years of life experience and their ability to come up with integrative answers was a hundred percent as good as uh, as the MBAs, and oh, so I said, I said, whoa, 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 what does this mean? You know, this means that that additional six years and ten years of life experience is good for nothing in making making you better at at doing uh, doing this thing. So that was a real wake up call. Then we started teaching teachers, high school teachers, because we had this conception, you know, how, how foolish we were. We had this conception that, well, you know, high school was really pushing it, that, that you know, your intellectual development was was just maybe barely ready. Now, that wake up call was no, your intellectual development is really ready. And some primary school teachers came to our our programs. And, and our first reaction was, oh, no, 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 that's silly. They, you can't teach it to, to kids like that. I mean, that, they're just too young to really understand this complicated tech, technique. And, and bless the, the teachers. The teachers were, uh, I, uh, I think we'll be the judge of that. And they started doing it. And so we now have t teachers in the, in the school system in Ontario uh, teaching as young as, as grade one and two students uh, how to do this. And here's the cool thing. They're really good at it. <laughs> They're really, really good at it. Uh, like it is just it is just charming, actually, to watch these these uh, kids work on solving uh, kind of either or uh, uh, challenges. And and we have all sorts of fairs at the school. They come in and I, I always get a weepy listening, listening uh, 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 to them. Um, and the, the bottom line is, is that they don't need to be untaught anything. Right. So that's their gigantic advantage. Uh, they're easily smart enough and they don't have a view already built up that life is full of either or choices where it's the devil or the deep blue sea. And, you know, you just have to suck it up and choose one bad choice over another. They don't understand that. Uh, and so when when you say, OK, there's this there's here's this choice. Do we do this or do they do uh, that? But here's a technique for figuring out something better. They're like. Sure, let, let's go do it. And they're great at it, like really good at it. You had a four-step 
uh, methodology for teaching that. Can you walk us through that a bit? Uh, sure. So, uh, so you start with the notion of, of, uh, uh, taking the two models, let's say, and, and we often use the Toronto International Film Festival as, as an example, you say there are two models of running a film festival like Toronto, the community oriented film festival. Anybody can go. There are not, uh, you know, uh, velvet ropes all, all, uh, all over the place. There's not a jury. It's just a friendly community, a film festival. And then there's con on the, on the, uh, on the other side, rather than saying, let's think about uh, something in, in between right away. You say, let's push those to the extreme the completely exclusive film festival, the completely inclusive film festival, right? And then, and then you lay out how they work. How do do, the, do each of those work and produce the out, outputs uh, that they uh, produce? And we ask, how does it work for the various uh, players involved? So, uh, how does it work for the community? How does it work for the uh, film industry? Uh, how does it work for the festival itself? Right. Uh, and, and you lay that out and you say, OK, here's how here's how this one works. And here's here's how Khan works. And here's how TIFF or Sundance or or Tribeca uh, uh, works. So that's one. You figure out how they uh, they work. Right. And then you ask yourself the question, what about these things do we love the most? What features, what mechanisms uh, do we love uh, of, uh, of both? Um, and then ask the question, thir third step is do what we call these integrative moves, because what we've uh, noticed is that there's three kinds of, of integrative moves. And in the case of the uh, TIFF, it was what we call a double down. So Pierce Handling, uh, who was running at TIFF at, at the time, uh, loved everything about the uh, inclusive community-oriented film festival. He loved what it did for the community, loved what it did for the, the, the industry, uh, loved what, he, uh, what it did for the, for, for the festival, but he loved one thing about uh, uh, Khan, and that is the buzz that it created that brought the attention of the international media, which made it a wonderful sponsorship opportunity. So Evian would pay a whole lot of money to make sure that a bottle of Evian's on the table when every starlet gets get, gets uh, interviewed, right? And so what uh, what Pierce did is say uh, is come up with this uh, this brilliant notion, which is we can make. Uh, the inclusive film festival even more inclusive in a way that gets us the one thing we want from the other model. And that was the People's Choice Award, right? So the People's Choice uh, Award said, we will create buzz around who's going to win the prize, but the prize won't be an exclusive prize of an exclusive jury that'll make the audience feel like, well, it's them. That's all about them. It's actually all about us. So it made the festival more inclusive and got the one thing he wanted from the, uh, the other model. And now TIFF is the most important film festival in the world. Uh, the, that's the third step. The fourth step is you got to try it, uh, try it, experiment uh, with it to see if it works. But uh, that, that is indeed what they did. It's worked better and better every every year. And now it's the most important uh, film festival in the world. Maybe not the most famous because Khan's been around for so long and famous for so long. But anybody in the industry says Toronto is the most important uh, film festival in the world. So that's that's integrative thinking, and and uh, you know, quite quite frankly, we've we've gotten to a place in the world. It feels to me where where we're presented all the time with things that are either or. You're either, uh, I mean, look at U.S. politics, right? You're either uh, you know a, a, a Trumpian or a or a or, or a uh, Biden guy and, and, you know, we just take sides and, you know, battle and, and, you know, f you know, fire missiles at one another. Uh, it, it feels as though all of this siloization of education has made people think that I can apply some narrow perspective on this. And it's the only perspective that is worthy. Uh, and if somebody, applies a different perspective to it and comes to a different point of view, it's because they're either stupid or evil. 
right? Like that's the explanation rather than saying, now that's interesting. What do they see that I don't see? Is there a way I could integrate some of what they uh, see into what I see to come up with a better, better idea? There's not, we don't seem to be taught the curiosity about that. We're taught to evaluate. Is my idea better than his or her idea? Yes, no. If it is, then I should beat them into submission, right? Or if it isn't, I should say, oh, dear, uh, they're right and I'm wrong. I kind of feel all terrible about being being wrong. It's uh, there's there's just not enough curiosity about a better a better way. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, one of the things that, that strikes me about that, I always ask myself when I see somebody doing something that I wouldn't do or strikes me as odd, I'm like, what would the world have to look like for that to be the option that I was engaging in, right? So, oh, that's good. That's good. That's that's a that's sort of a variant of the question I asked in strategy, which is the most powerful question in strategy: is what would have to be true, not what is true. What would have to be true for that to be a great idea? Because that that gets you gets you uh, kind of noodling around another logic, and and it is possible that by taking pieces of another logic structure, you can come up with a with a better idea. I want to come to strategy in a second, but uh, just before we leave integrative thinking here, are there limitations to this idea? I mean, it sounds very um, novel to be faced with a hard choice with trade-offs and come up with an option that sort of like mixes this either or thinking. And where do you see this falling apart and where do you see it really underapplied? Well, I'd see it underapplied in the world in general, right? Uh, I guess is is uh, uh, is my view. Um, and lots of people just ask me, you know, about limitations and should you do this all the time and and the like. And I say, listen, you know, if if the choice is is between kind of lying on the beach or getting kicked in the groin, um, you don't need to use integrative thinking. I'll take lying on a beach, right? Uh, but it's when it's when you feel like, oh, I, I, I hate, I hate the fact that I have to, uh, that I apparently have to choose here. So you don't love uh, either, uh, either option, either choice. And, and you, and that's the time that's, that's when a little light should go off in your head and say, ah, ah, ah stop, don't choose because you don't like uh, either. But I mean, I use it <laughs> all the time. I mean, I'm feeling all cheery these days about Tennis Canada, uh, because uh, this Monday in the rankings, the the men's rankings in this case, in in this case, we're doing well on the women's side too. But in the men's ranking, uh, Canada had three uh, players in the top twenty. Uh, interesting fact is that this is the first time in Canadian history that we had the most players in the top twenty. We were tied with Russia. Russia's got three. We've got three. U.S., Spain, all these other powerhouses uh, uh, have have fewer. Before 2005, when we put in place the Tennis Canada strategy that's resulted in this, we had zero in history. Um, and what was the what was the magic solution uh, to, that transformed us from a nothing country, literally a nothing country that was irrelevant to a leading tennis nation where everybody says, how is it that they've got so many great players from a little country that's got snow all the time? Um, and uh, and the answer is we, we looked at the French system, which is a more control oriented uh, system in the U.S. system, which is a you know wild west kind of system and said, how can we rather than choose between them, come up with a better solution? So I, you can apply integrative thinking to create you know, like incredible uh, uh, outcomes uh, left, right, center. I did it at the Rotman School, too. Uh, that was a product of integrative thinking choices. So I. I I mean, maybe I have a hammer, so every every uh, darn thing looks like a nail, but I do eat the dog food, right? I apply this uh, to all the tasks that that uh, that I have, um, and it it it's proven to be extremely valuable. I uh, interesting backside. I mean, I, I sort of hit on this as well. I went to business school in two thousand and seven, and I almost dropped out because I was just so disappointed in what I was. 
I come from a world of like Charlie Munger and sort of like interdisciplinary thinking. And I got to business school and I was like, this is ridiculous, right? Like none of these subjects are connected to each other. Oh, really? So that uh, good. I'm well, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you, uh, you figured that out. Most people don't. They, they, they become indoctrinated into that notion. Right. They come in indoctrinated into the notion that my job as a business person is to figure out into what category this problem that I'm facing falls and then apply that tool. Ah, this is a finance problem, so I will apply the capital asset pricing model or this is an HR problem, so I'll apply theory X, theory Y. They, they're, they're a tool matcher. Right. And that's and that's why MBAs are viewed widely as these incredibly narrow minded people. Oh, that's so fascinating. Have you seen, I want to come back to that in a second. Have you seen a lot of changes in terms of the incoming students, like with these girls that you sort of went back to in grade 10 and you taught them integrative thinking, have they had like tangible or quantifiable sort of results that are different as a result? They, it's more anecdotal, but yeah, lots of them, lots of them, uh, you know, come back to us and tell us tell us stories of what they what they've done and what they've been uh, up to. Although, or, or they'll go back to their teachers and 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 tell them. I mean, it, it is something I'm encouraging the I think people to do is is start collecting more data to show the the effectiveness uh, of it. Uh, but we have some great stories. There's one of our uh, absolutely fave teachers um, uh, teaches grade three and four and she was teaching grade three in a big school, right? That has a bunch of classes of, of each and uh, the grade four teacher, you know, came up, came up to her at, you know, at, at, at lunch and said, uh, you know, in the first week, uh, let me name uh, a bunch of names uh, and, uh, and you tell me uh, whether they were in your section of grade three and she goes, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, T, G, and, and, uh, and our, and our teacher is like, well, how do you, how do, how do you know that? And, uh, and the, the grade four teacher just says, they're like, they behave completely differently. They ask a different set of questions. Uh, you know, they do this, 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 and, and our teacher was sort of like, hmm, you know, uh, that's good. But she was a hundred percent a hundred percent accurate in, without, without, without knowing she was a hundred percent accurate in identifying, uh, our, our teachers, uh, our graduates. And then that teacher became a fanatic about it too, because she said that they're just better. They're just better. So good. Uh, we were talking a little bit while we were, um, before we started recording about sort of model matching in the MBA and how one of the problems that I have with the MBA is it was so siloed and you're given these models. Here's a finance model. Here's a strategy model. Here's a decision-making model. And we don't think of integrating those models. Can you sort of riff on that a little bit and in terms of how that impacts education and the role of models being maybe the best model we have at the time, but not the only model? I, the way I think about uh, business education is that it's, it's you know, think of visualized like one of those little red toolboxes, right? You, carry, you, you come in as a student with that empty and and you get a bunch of tools, you get a hammer and you get pliers and you get the screwdriver and whatever put in your, in your, in your toolbox and you're taught to size up a problem and ask the question, is this, is a hammer best for this? Uh, is a, is pliers best uh, for this? Is a screwdriver best for this? Is a wrench best, best for this? And so it's this job of matching a bunch of narrow models to real world problems. And that's why MBAs, unfortunately, get get you know uh, get criticized for being these sort of you know we had an MBA here and he did this silly thing and the silly thing if you analyze w w what way the person criticized what the MBA did it, it typically falls into the category of they applied one narrow model to a broad uh, a broad question and I understand why they do it that's what they're taught that's literally what they they are taught and. You know, you can recall this from your own MBA, you know, when you do a case, right, uh, uh, case study, uh, uh, the case has been written to illustrate a tool, right? The answer comes from applying a given tool, like, and you, and, and we're made to think, oh, these are just general business situations. No, they're not. The, 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 the writing of our business uh, school cases has evolved to this art form, which is to write a case that illustrates one narrow, uh, tool. Uh, and, and, and so that's what the business school world 
uh, spits out and, and it spits, spits it out into a world that's organized that way. I always found w- working with MBAs a, a bit sort of difficult afterwards because they want these packages very much like case studies. And, and what you're sort of reinforcing without, you know, unconsciously, I think, is that all the information in the package is all the information that you need to make this decision or all the information that's relevant and pertinent. And that is so often in real life, it's not the case at all. We get absolutely what we educate for. There's no no question in my, in my mind. Uh, you know, same in economics, right? Uh, there are a thousand partial equilibrium economists for every single general equilibrium economist. And so we have economists who, who yeah, kind of, uh, know everything about, you know, whatever fiscal policy, but nothing about labor policy or labor economics or, or environmental policy or, or the like. They, uh, and they, and they do the, you know, I'm not going to think about all those things, but I'm going to, I'm going to think about the thing that my model covers. And it happens in, in medicine too. Uh, uh, we had a we had a, a wonderful lady work with us on applying integrative thinking to to the medical field, uh, which is which has been very val- valuable and, and worked out well. And she was talking about her her uh, residency and when she was a resident, her attending, saying things like, "Could you check on the liver in in room two seventeen? Right? It's not check how." Mrs. Smith, who has got uh, kind of liver problems, and it's literally check the liver, right? And and she said, you know, it's it's down to that sort of kind of narrowness. We're not even going to talk about the person. We're going to talk about uh, uh, you know one organ uh, in in the body. And so we're we're sort of teaching from from the word go, not to think holistically, to think to think as narrowly as uh, as possible. And it causes blindness, right? Like we miss obvious things because we're just looking for something to fit this model. And then we, we want to apply this model that we know. And I, I found this with my, I had a computer science degree and then went into sort of the corporate world. And then, you know, you start managing people and all of a sudden most of my computer science degree is irrelevant, right? Computers do what they're told to do. You know, if there's a mistake, it's always with you. People are biological systems. They're much different. And, and I found a lot of the education that I had learned just didn't apply anymore. But the way that I tended to approach problems was very based on this comfort level with this is how I was taught to approach problems in school. And this is my experience. And then you carry that with you. Absolutely. And it's a very interesting thing on on, on kind of people and uh, a huge difference. So our MBAs. Uh, at the Rotman School, have about four, four and a half years of work ex- experience. Our executive MBAs have about 14 or 15 years of work experience. So the MBAs take on average less than one second year uh, course in the entire OBHRM field, right? They just don't think that stuff is important uh, at all, right? They, they load up on finance and strategy courses more so than any, any other courses. The Embas have an insatiable desire for uh, for OBHR uh, courses because they they have the learning that you that you had when when you got into the into the real real world. They've been working in the real world for fifteen years, and they realize that you know everything is a people uh, people issue. You know, I I don't think we do a good enough job in in business school and helping these students understand that taking courses in that field, understanding more about the, di- the people dynamics is important. Uh, but they, those courses, as you well know, uh, from having taken it are less replete with, with very formal models where you can calculate something right in finance, you can calculate uh, yield curves or sharp ratios or, or whatever, and you can do a five forces analysis or a Nash equilibrium in your strategy uh, uh, course. Uh, so they feel more comfortable learning a model because they wish the world would behave according to models uh, like that quantitative sort of mechanical uh, model. So they're more comfortable with, with uh, that. We, we do that in the workplace, too. And I notice this with policies and procedures, right? Procedures are basically like an algorithm that you apply given a certain situation, certain inputs. And what I discovered is that it just eliminated thinking. 
um, because people would go, oh, there's no procedure for the slight deviation from what would happen. And I can't respond because uh, at first you can, but you lose that ability over time to actually apply judgment. Well, maybe I shouldn't apply this procedure in this particular case and I have to do something different. And that's where this, this teaching thinking and teaching judgment sort of comes in. And I find that when we get into organizations, we actually reinforce this modeled siloed predictable way of solving problems. Absolutely. I, and, there, and if we want to go on this, this vector, it gets even worse than what you've described. Right? Oh, go <laughs> on. <laughs> which is, which is we, we dramatically, vastly overuse science. Um, so what, what, business, what you were taught in business school, and you tell me if, I, if, if I'm wrong, wrong on this, is that a good business man or woman, businessman in your case, if you're going to be a good businessman, Shane, you will make decisions based on analysis. Yeah. Right. You'll do the analysis and make a decision. You're some kind of a corporate floozy if you're just going making decisions without without the anal, uh, the analysis uh, behind it. So you can ask the question, where does analysis come from? And the answer is from Aristotle. Uh, <laughs> for 2,400 years ago, uh, 4th century BC, Aristotle essentially created science. Uh, the book is called Analytica Posteriora, where he, where he sort of was the first man in the world to say, here's how you can determine, and what he used, the terms he used, this, here's how you can have a rigorous methodology for determining the cause of a given effect. Right, you experiment, experiment, watch, watch, collect data, and you can say, "Aha, this causes uh, causes that." Okay, and and uh, all of the the future of science is based based on uh, Aristotle's understanding. We think that science came from the scientific revolution. Bacon, Newton, Descartes, Galileo, they formalized what Aristotle uh, did two thousand years uh, uh, before them. So the guy who invented science, though, pointed out something about science. Uh, he said, he said, science, this methodology I've used is for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. So you know, what does he mean by that? Well, if I let go of this pen, what'll happen? It's It'll fall. fall. Yeah. Uh, if I let go of this pen 10 years from now, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. If, if I let this go of this pen in Antarctica, it's going to fall. That's the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Right? And so, so there, it makes a whole lot of sense, right? If I observe all pen falls that have ever happened in, in the past, what's it a pretty damn good predictor of? The future. Pen falls in the future, right? So that's the part of the world where things can uh, cannot be other than they are. And And he said... That's what you need to use this scientific reasoning uh, method to be rigorous about understanding. Because, you know, at, at one point we thought it fell because all objects like to be closer to Mother Earth. And, you know, that, and, and eventually we figured out that, no, there's a universal force called gravity that pushes everything down. That's the development of, of scientific knowledge. But the guy who invented science warned, he said, but there's another part of the world. There's another part of the world, and that, that part of the world is the part of the world where things can be other than they are. Right? Think about, think about, think about these. Right? In 1998, did you have one of these within one arm's length of you and you started to get hives if it was more than one arm length away? No, because it didn't exist. The first one existed in 1999. And everything about human life is different now because of, because of that that thing. That's the part of the world humans interacting uh, that where things can be other than they are. And you know what Aristotle said? The guy who invented science said about that part of the world: Do not use the scientific method. Why would he say that? Well, if you use the scientific method to understand how people interact with technology, right? you will demonstrate to yourself that this could never exist right? because you've crunched all the data. How much do people use smartphones? Not at all, right? Because they don't exist, right? You'll predict, you'll predict that. You'll predict that it'll continue to, to be, and you'll be like, you know, Nokia and, and, uh, and think that feature phones will, will, will rule 
uh, will rule forever. But he, the guy who invented science said, don't, don't do that. And what he said is in that part of the world, the job of rigorous thinking is to imagine possibilities and choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. So in the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are science, analyze data, collect as much data, analyze it rigorously to determine causes of effects. In this other part of the world, imagine possibilities and choose the one for which the most compelling uh, argument can be made. And he said, the job of human beings in that former world is to understand the causes of the effects that we see so that we can optimize the world to that, right? We observe all these people who smoke getting lung cancer so we can optimize against that by trying to stop people from, uh, from uh, smoking. Uh, he said in the other part of the world, human beings job is to be the cause of the effect they want to see, right? To change the world in, in, a, in a better way by imagining possibilities and making those, those new things, uh, come true. What we've done is said that is for kind of, you know, you know, bad floozy type, uh, type people. The good ones are the ones who always apply science. I I like that, that way of thinking in terms of like how you're explaining it. it, We we are taught these models, we apply them as if they predict the future, but the reality is we're in a constantly evolving and changing environment and our ability to predict the future is more limited than we think it, it it actually is. I mean, if we were able to predict the future, we would have seen COVID come in. We would have seen a whole bunch of things coming. Uh, and, and that sort of relates to your your latest book about how we we hyper we predict this. I almost think of it as this beam of light. We predict this beam of light into the future as if that's the only possible future, and then we optimize for that particular future. So we we um, take away margins of safety in the supply chain. We I, I sort of think of it as you know. We take margins of safety and we turn them into money, which is what business school in a way has traditionally taught us to do, right? Uh, you, you know, you don't need just in time inventory is better because you have less inventory on the balance sheet. Uh, all these buffers and the slack that we sort of develop, but these buffers and the slack allow us to position for multiple possible futures. They allow us to easily pivot when the world doesn't work the way that we, we think it was. The problem I see with this and, and the pushback that, I give myself when I think like this is that in the moment being inefficient and positioning for multiple possible futures is always suboptimal to somebody who's hyper efficient for this one particular future. So in the short run, we're always looking like we're behind, but in the long run, we always win. And then we have to deal with this sort of like timeline difference. If you're the CEO of a company, I mean, what's your average tenure? It's a couple of years, right? So you have to sort of like get in, do your thing and get out. And you're not thinking about it from a long-term point of view, but I'd love to hear your riff on this. Well, I mean, I, I can't do much better riff than you, right? I mean, I think your diagnosis is, is, uh, is bang on. And this is, this is why I think a great, a CEO, and I've talked a lot. Uh, you probably know Paul Pullman. He's a he's a friend of a friend of mine. He's always nice enough to say that I taught him a strategy when he used to be at Procter and Gamble. But um, we talk about it is that the part of the CEO's job is to create enough of that discretion so that they can do those things right that uh, that they know are going to be in the interests long term. Like in your case, building up some slack, you know, for the for the bad times. Uh, because if they don't build that up, they will be forced into the 100% efficiency now, and that'll kill them sometime in the future. Now, it may not kill them during the time they're CEO, uh, but they won't, won't have shown great stewardship for their organization. So, so I think you're, I think you're right, and 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 it's one of the challenges of the modern capital markets, right? The modern capital markets say, "Gimme, gimme, gimme," right? If you're not using some money, uh, you know, uh, buyback uh, shares or, or, or dividend uh, back to me, lever your lever yourself up so you have a more efficient capital structure. All of all of those things are are taking away that that optimal amount of slack that that CEO has to make 
decisions that are good for the company for the long term to invest in things for for the future. Um, and that's why that's one of the reasons why I, th- I think right that America had a huge advantage over the rest of the world for probably 30, 40, 50 years, somewhere between 1930 and 1980, where it had the best capital markets in the world for helping companies grow and prosper. Uh, I think in 2020 now, America has got uh, a capital market that is a detriment to American uh, competitiveness because it is causing companies to behave in ways that aren't good for the company, its employees, America o- over overall. Oh, double click on that. Go deeper. Talk to me about that. Well, I I I think what what we're what we're getting is this taking away of uh, of uh, managerial uh, slack, focusing, uh, driving managers as much as they can to managing for the short term for the for uh, this uh, this quarter. Now you have CEOs who who you know who stand against that, um, but the the pressure is is in in that direction and it's and it's dramatic uh, pressure and and it's causing all these bad things right there are you know studies that say cfos you know 40 uh, percent of cfos freely admit uh, uh that uh, they will they will not make an investment that they know is npv positive uh in order to make this quarter's uh, uh guidance Right. So all all of that stuff is causing companies to to perform less well uh, than they than they could. And and that's a capital market problem. That's that's why I think I think we're going to look back. 2050, we'll look back on this period, 19. 40 ish, 35, 40 ish to say 20, 20, 25 or 30 uh, as this insane period where we thought the widely held publicly traded corporation was the optimal form. And we're going to we're going to look back and say, what were we idiots thinking? You know, that that's crazy. It, it, it didn't work. Uh, it created created all the wrong uh, the wrong incentives. And we're going to be to be into uh, a world of of. Uh, more controlled uh, companies. Yeah. Doesn't this create like an arbitrage or almost competitive advantage for private companies or companies that are largely owned by one shareholder? When I look back and I I look at Berkshire Hathaway's like track record, one of the things I ascribe that to is that Buffett and Munger controlled about 40% of the shares until recently. So they could sit on cash and not do anything and not worry about an activist investor or, you know, and what they were really doing, I think personally, is they're positioning for multiple possible futures because they don't know what to do. They have no degree of certainty in what the future looks like tomorrow. So we're just going to sit here and position for all of these possible futures. The same thing they did in March when people were like, why didn't you deploy all this money into the stock market? Well, that's easy to say looking back with hindsight of what what the stock market has done since then. But at the time, it's like, well, cash might become the most valuable thing in the world. So we're going to sit on it and position for multiple possible outcomes. But it's always suboptimal. And so you need this control, which is comes from a private company often or family controlled or um, sort of, you could even probably get away with it with a super charismatic CEO, but these companies will actually, given what you're saying, if that's correct, they'll have more of an advantage over the next 30 years because they'll be able to build up the balance sheet because they have extra inventory and they can take advantage of sort of call it the professionalization of management, uh, in terms of model thinking, which is eliminating slack, eliminating, uh, and, and preparing for this next quarter and being hyper efficient on this next quarter. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, I've, I've actually got an article on this subject coming out in the January, February HBR on what I think is, is the, we're approaching the tail end of the domination of the widely held publicly traded corporation as the corporate model. It's just got too many problems that are arguably getting worse, not, uh, uh, not better. And, and, you know, it's one of these things is there are so many things in life where it's like, how, how on earth did the logic structure hold for so long? Right. So the view of a board of a widely held publicly traded professionally managed company, right, is that 
we need to have the board, you know, and Mike Jensen, uh, as, you, as I'm sure you know, wrote, wrote about uh, this with agency, the agency theory that that managers are imperfect agents, right? They have self-control problems. They are not necessarily going to manage on behalf of the shareholders, right? And and so we have to we have to discipline them. Right to make sure that the that the agency costs are not too high. What's our tool? Well, they report to a board of directors who represents uh, who represents shareholders, in and they can discipline them. Now, did anybody ask the question? What exactly are those board members? Would they not be agents, just like management? <laughs> And so what you're saying is that our solution to the agency problem is to put a fox in charge of the hen house. That's our solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll really work well. I mean, it's like where where on earth did this logic uh, uh, come from? Right. There either is an agency problem, in which case we have put foxes in charge of the, the, the hen house or there isn't. An agency problem, in which case we shouldn't be bothering with any of this, any of this crap. But the idea that that a board will discipline discipline uh, uh, management is is just an absolute fantasy, uh, and that's a core kind of element of the logical structure that guides the workings of the capital markets, the equity markets, and and the widely held publicly traded uh, companies. It's just theater. It is theater. Oh, my God. But it gives us comfort because we're like, oh, the board's watching out for us. And, you know, like, yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I think of boards of directors as being uh, like fire insurance that works except when there's a fire. I think they can work, though. Like if you have um, I, I think what I love to see on boards is it's not necessarily a large ownership of the company, but a high percentage of the person's net worth involved um, sort of like really invested people but they don't meet all of these requirements that we're starting to see in terms of like the ideal board according to the stock exchange and the ideal board according to sort of if you're a person who who might think and apply a little bit of judgment to it are often two very different things right i agree i i mean i honestly think that a good versus bad board members the the key criteria are kind of psychographic ones Oh, expand on that. Well, they're attitudinal. They're, 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 what does the person think of his or her role in life, right? Uh, it's things like that, not are they a sitting CEO or were they a CEO or do they have financial expertise or whatever? It's, it's how do they, how do they behave? How do they, how do they think about their job? And, and, you know, I've, I've written about this too. I think the only, the only, useful reason for wanting to be on a board uh, is uh, is that you think uh, a well-functioning board is integral to the success of uh, democratic capitalism. Now, how many people think that that's the reason for being on a board? Not not many. Like, and, and most of the reasons for wanting to be on a board are bad for the effectiveness of the board, right? So one reason for being on the board is it's good pay. Well, if you think it's good pay, then you will not you will not do anything to sacrifice good pay. Uh, being on a board is prestigious. Well, you're not going to do anything that will sacrifice the prestige. Uh, it's a good camaraderie with other interesting people. Well, you're not going to do anything that sacrifices camaraderie. I mean, they're all they're all bad reasons for being uh, kind of on a board. Again, one of my theories in life is if you're putting something together, you have to think of what is it that would cause a person of the sort you need to fill the chair that you have designated. I, I, I talk about this in terms of uh, bond bond rating, right? We, we said uh, in the global financial crisis, what, what on earth were these bond raters doing rating things triple A like, with like, you know, a infinitesimal uh, kind of uh, probability of default uh, and, and they were defaulting 100 percent, 100 percent. You know, how can this possibly be? Well, you've got to ask the question, what would cause somebody to willingly sit in a chair called bond rater at 
uh, and Moody's or, or, uh, or S and S and P. Uh, and I think the only logical answer you can come, uh, come to is that they are the only reason they would be in that chair is that they're not particularly good at rating bonds, right? Because if they had a skill set that made them good at rating bonds, what chair would they be sitting in? They'd be trading bonds. <laughs> They'd be either sitting in a chair at Goldman or, or, or Morgan Stanley or their own bo- or Apollo or their own bo- their bond fund. So the only people who are who would would think of being at Moody's or S and P, right, rating bonds, the only people who will do that are definitively less good at rating bonds than the people who are running the bond, the, the bond market. And, and sure enough, you know, they, they came up, they came up wanting, but that's, that's this fallacy of, of we, we identify jobs for people, create that chair, and then don't think about whether it is possible to get somebody to sit in that chair that can actually do the job that we need them, uh, uh, we need them to do. Like think about stockbrokers, right? What's the only thing you know about, uh, uh, about a person that there's only one thing you can know absolutely positively without a shadow of a doubt about a, uh, a stockbroker. The only thing that's for sure, you don't know if they're male or female, young or old. And, but what you know is that they're crummy at picking stocks. Cause if they were good, they wouldn't be a stockbroker. They would be a hedge fund. Yeah. But th- this is sort of why I like to see boards with significant personal ownership as a material amount of their wealth, because I think you know, maybe it just gives me another narrative for why they're on the board, but I think it also gives them a lot of investment in terms of the success or failure of the business. And it takes us away from the short-term planning cycle, uh, of sort of thinking about it in quarter by quarter basis and start thinking in sort of like decades, uh, and what you have to do and the investments you have to make to make this company not only sustainable, but position it for multiple possible futures as things change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example from my own life. I was on the Thomson Reuters, Thomson and then Thomson Reuters uh, board for 14 years. And, and a guy I love who was on for all the time I was on was Vance Opperman and the Opperman family owned West, their legal publishing company, the best the best business in, in Tom, just a chest of Yeah. What gorgeous. a moat that has. <laughs> yes. A gorgeous uh, business. And, and, Vance, you know, A was in it for the long haul. Uh, last time I checked, he's still on the board. I've been off the board for like six or seven years. So he'd been on the board for 20 or 25 years by now. And, and, uh, I don't know how much the Opperman family has in Thompson stock, but I think it's still quite a, you know, quite a bit from, from the, the, from the original, uh, transaction. And yeah, he takes his job deadly seriously and thinks about the long haul and, and, uh, and is an awesome, uh, director. He, you know, he, he's probably one of the best directors I've, uh, witnessed in action. So I, I, I agree. Skin, skin in the game is a good thing, uh, to be sure, you know, that doesn't, <laughs> that, that, it's not, you know, it's sort of like it's three times south, you know, they must own stock that's three times annual board fees. That's for those people. Unfortunately, that's trivial. That's trivial. The, your desired desired outcome happens, unfortunately, and only a, a small amount of uh, the time. Totally agree. You, you study, you've worked with, you've read a lot about leadership. Are there common patterns to success that you've seen across leaders other than integrative thinking? Um, I mean, they, they tend to relate to relate to integrative thinking. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, great leaders are, are, uh, yeah, have as a core characteristic when somebody says something to them that doesn't agree with where their head is now, the model that, cause we all, we model everything and we say, I, you know, I'm uh, running this company and, and uh, you know, and I think, you know, I think this is the best, the best product that we, that, that we offer. And somebody, somebody uh, comes up to you and says, Roger, that is going south. That sucks. Uh, I don't know why we're investing so much in that. Um, a great leader's first reaction is, Hmm. Say more. T- you know, tell you know, tell tell me tell me tell me more about why. I want to understand why you think that. What you see that I don't see. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that's because you know it has this like 
super big not like knock on effect right so one it causes your subordinates to all think that if you've got an interesting thought i'm open to open to uh, hearing it i don't i'm not going to just shut that uh, shut that down because it disagrees with me so everybody kind of is more inclined to to think about things and think about things uh, uh differently and not be a not be afraid of that and you just get more raw materials because what we learned in integrative thinking is is if we go back to that that tiff example unpacking how the inclusive festival works and unpacking how the uh, exclusive fe uh, festival works all that unpacking gives raw materials which you can kind of recombine in entirely new ways in associative ways right yeah exactly exactly so when i say this is our best product and we are going to win on the basis of this that's only a set of raw materials that relate to that theory uh, and if I can incorporate in a whole, whole another huge pile of raw materials, there's a, just another pile of raw materials I have access to, then then I can then I have a chance of coming up with a much better, much more powerful uh, a solution. Uh, and the person might be wrong, right? Uh, you know that that this is not this is not a terrible product, uh, but actually there's a weakness in 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 this product that by using that person's thinking we can get rid of and so we end up going with the product anyway but in a in a in a different way uh than before that to me is key i think another thing that is that is key is is and this this may this may sound a little funny but is uh because you could say it contrasts with my view of possibilities but uh it, the other thing is that they are kind of deterministic, right? So the great leaders are able to say, if if this happens, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, we're screwed. Or if this happens, this happens, we'll be on, we'll be in the kingpin's seat. Like the less good leaders sort of just say, well, we're just going to sort of bob and weave our way down the field and and see what see what happens. They're not they're not deterministic enough. Um, and so so I like I think stronger leaders are willing to have a hypothesis about how they think things are going to play out, then be open to seeing seeing changes in that. But that gives them the boldness to make decisions, right, because you have to commit assets uh, irrevocably to decisions to be great as a as a company you can't just say well we'll do a little bit of this a little bit of that and we'll shift and change you have to say at a certain points in time this is worth investing in and we won't be able to get the money back because it'll be invested in a building or invested in a piece of software or invested in these in these in these people and so they they are willing to make those those choices because they say you know unless we do that we're not going to get uh get to this place and i guess the, la the last the last one is just uh i i just don't know any what i think of as great great leaders who don't love other people right i mean if, if you think people are annoying and you have to put up with them and put up with their foibles rather than you genuinely love them uh then then i i, I think you can only be so good uh, uh, of, of, uh, of a leader. I want to come back to sort of taking bold action here. And I think fear often prevents us from taking bold action. We might do a little of something outside of the ordinary, but not too much because if we fail and we do something that's far deviant from the norm, we're moving out of this Gaussian distribution and we're going to the fat tails. And we've been taught that we don't want to be in those fat tails unless we're extremely successful. Right. But uh, this way, if we're wrong, we're not too wrong. And one of the reasons I think that we we like to keep within this narrow, maybe call it one standard deviation band is fear. And how, I'm curious as to your view, but how we develop courage in the face of fear and the role of narratives um, and the story we tell ourselves and our employees. You're absolutely right. And, uh, and, you know, I've just written, a, written a post on this or the first, the first of a three, three part post on, on, uh, fear, I call it fear rules because fear rules us. And there are rules for managing, managing fear, but it is, it does come to, uh, 
to telling ourselves uh, stories. I mean, we, we create uh, fear or make fear go away, depending on what story we tell ourselves. Um, and, uh, and my, you know, my observation is that because the people understand this and understand the debilitating aspect of fear. And that's why I, that's why I, I argue that the, in Hollywood, the number one box office star, uh, of every era of movies played one character. Uh, and that is somebody who faced fear and didn't act, uh, fearfully charismatic, unblinking, well-dressed James Bond sort of as James Bond. Yes. Yeah. Or, or, or Tony Stark, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Like they're, they're the same or, or, or Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger or, or Humphrey Bogart is sort of, the, they, they all play the same character, right? Which is ha ha ha, you know, this is the, I, I can wisecrack my way through this. And, and it's, it is, and it resonates so deeply with people because it's a, if I, if only I could do that, in the face of uh, of fear, I I would be su- successful, and instead I I am I am ruled by uh, by my fear. So yeah, I I I I I think most fear we create ourselves, right? We we produce it ourselves as a as a as a reaction, uh, and trying to tell yourself a story of of uh, how you can sort of deal with that uh, is, is important. And, you know, people think of my, think of me as having been a successful Dean at, at, at the Rotman school, bless them. Um, but they don't, there's some things they, they don't, they don't know. Um, like, you know, what? We, like, well, we created a completely different economic model that enabled the school to go from, from, you know, having a budget of, 13 million in the last year before I got there to 130 million in uh, the last year I was dean. We needed a new economic model because the University of Toronto economic models were nuts, uh, and so you couldn't plan for the future. And I went to to Rob Pritchard, the president uh, who hi- hired me, and Adel Sedra, the provost who hired me, and and said after about three or four months, you, know, you hired me to make this a great school. We can't. Sorry, uh, we can't with the current model. And the current model was every year the provost decides how much revenue you have, right? Uh, it's not, not not things you can do that build revenue. It's like they allocate you, and I said, I, we just can't do that. I, here's what I'm going to I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to double the size of the program, quadruple tuition, quintuple the endowment, quintuple executive education, and get this much uh, money to spend and we'll have a, we can have a great business school. Uh, but in the current economic model, that money won't flow to the, the, to the business school. So we can't plan, plan for it. Uh, and I said, I, I'd be happy to be, uh, pay you a tax. And right now our tax is, is uh, about, you know, two or $3 million a year to the, to, uh, of 13 million under this plan, uh, you can get, you can have a $40 million tax. Um, but we need a different system. And they both said, okay, okay, okay. And let's, and, and, uh, we'll work on that. And, uh, and I said, in the meantime, can I spend the way I, I was planning to spend? And they said, yes, but this was just verbally. And so, uh, I thought they were going to work this through the governance process, maybe in <laughs> six months or nine months. It took four years. Yeah. And in those four years, I because we had to go into massive deficit, fourteen million dollar accumulated deficit, which we then came came out of uh, completely. The whole plan had paying it back, so that we were that we were uh, plus. But for each of those days, nights for for four years, I had to go to bed with the recognition that if Adel Sedra, the provost, lost faith uh, in, in his ability to get this different different system through governance, through governing council and, and all those, those people, and said, Roger is running an unauthorized $14 million deficit, my career in Canada would have been over. I would have been, I would have been fired. Uh, I would have been on the front pages of the Globe and Mail as having as having kind of illicitly spent fourteen million dollars, uh, and I would have probably had to leave the country and go back to the go back to the uh, the states where I where, where I had been living. 
Not only that, I couldn't tell a soul this because if I told anybody that and they started to act that way, it would encourage Adel to believe that I believed that he might not actually actually do it. So I had to live for four years with the sort of Damocles, literally. I literally went to bed and the sort of Damocles was above my, above my, my head. But I mean, I told myself, uh, you know, a story, which is just Roger, are you doing the right thing or the wrong thing? You know, is this good for the school? Good for Canada? Good for university of Toronto or not? Yes. Did you actually ask for permission and they gave it to you verbally? Yes. Um, and could you, you know, go back, to the States, go back to your old job and pick the pieces, pieces, uh, up. Maybe you could never get, come back to Canada again because you'd be such an embarrassment, but, but, uh, how, how bad is that? And I said, yeah, this, it's worth it. It's, it, it, you know, this won't kill me. It's worth it. But that narrative is what gave you the power to sort of maintain the course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I, but I could have told, told myself the story, you will be crushed. Um, you're a Canadian, you're an Ontarian. Uh, this is your home. You would be, you would be embarrassed thoroughly. Your family would be embarrassed. Everybody would be, uh, uh, embarrassed. Uh, and I could have focused on, on that. And I would have probably caved, uh, and gone back to Adel and Rob and say, we got to work our way out of this. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, change directions and I'll stop spending and, uh, you know, I don't know whatever. And, and the Rotman school wouldn't be the Rotman school. It is, it is today. Well, luckily it all worked out, right? Like had it not worked <laughs> out, I'm, I'm curious to see if he would have thrown you under the bus or sort of, uh, I guess only, only you would know that in him, but, uh, yes. And I got to say Adel, Adel, who then went on to be uh, president of, uh, University of Waterloo is great man. And he didn't like I had, I had my faith properly, properly placed. He followed through and it was hard. He got a lot of pushback. Are you doing a special deal? And, da, 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 da. and the thing that makes me happiest is, is, uh, then David Naylor, when he became C, uh, president of University of Toronto, he applied the Rotman system to the whole university. It was a, it, there's a better system for, for being able to plan for the, for the long, uh, uh for the long term. So, so I, yes, I, I wanted to make sure Adel, Adel stood a hundred percent, uh, uh, by me. Coming back to sort of the leaders that you've worked with, we talked about common patterns of success. Are there common patterns of failure or self-sabotage that you see repeated over and over again in otherwise smart, decent people? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of it has to do with this not being, not having a, a, a sort of a deterministic enough view. So the failure mode I see probably more than anything else is somebody who is what I think of as not strategic, right? Which is that, which is that they, they sort of believe that they need to always keep all their options open, not make big choices uh, and sort of see what, see what evolves and, and, and then just react to, to, uh, to what, ev what evolves. Uh, that's probably, that's probably failure mode. Number, number one, if that's connected to, and I don't really like people, uh, that's a, that's a sure thing, <laughs> right? That's a, that's a certain, uh, kind of, uh, 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 disaster. And, you know, it's the three things I talked about. And if they're just not curious, uh, if somebody comes to them with disconfirming kind of data, they want to suppress it rather than, rather than absorb it and mine it for, for everything they can, uh, they can get. Interesting enough, that tends to, you know, those two things tend to be linked. Like it is a big system, right? Which is, which is you tend to like people if people are this repository of stuff you can't see yeah. and you're constantly learning and yeah, you're very yeah. curious. So then they're good. Then they're good. Yeah. But if instead they're a threat, yeah. then you just wish you didn't have these annoying people around who are keep on threatening your, your prevailing, uh, point of, uh, view and the one you prefer to just keep, uh, and not, and not be kind of messed with by, by anybody. So those two things I think, uh, end up, uh, being linked and they're probably, I haven't thought about this. You, you raise a good, good question gets me thinking is probably it is linked to the sort of the non-deterministic too. 
Right. If you if if your model is sort of impoverished because you aren't absorbing, building in other things, the chances are it'll be harder for you to come up with with things that you can be confident in to say, you know what, I think it is time to invest here, go here, let's bet on bet on this. So they pr- probably all those three things are, are either deficient together or or there together and and kind of self reinforcing. You mentioned strategy. What is strategy and what's the difference between a good strategy and a bad strategy? Well, I think about strategy as a, a set of choices that that uh, enables you to invest in a given place uh, to win, whether that's geography or business or whatever. So it it's it's that set of set of uh, uh, choices. And what do I mean by winning? I mean in the field of play that you choose, you have a better value proposition for the customers in that space than uh, than anybody else. And you know, a, a good strategy is is uh, is one that has a logic that holds up to that. That that when when you put it into into action, you do uh, uh, get a better position where you've chosen to play than uh, than any competitor. And a bad strategy is one where you're sort of. Is it you're chasing multiple things? You don't understand your sort of flywheel of success. Like it can be any that. any of those things. It, it's do, one kind of bad strategy is a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, we're going to do a little bit of here, a little bit of there, a little bit of uh, there. You know, um, uh, another you know, kind of crummy strategy would be one where where the economics don't en- enable you to continue it. Right. You can start on it, but it's not a remunerative enough model for you to be able to continue to invest behind it. So it sort of uh, withers, withers away. Another is is kind of bad strategy is just trying to do the same as everybody else and assume that you're going to win anyway. You know, that's that's the that's the great managerial conceit. We can we don't have to do anything unique or different uh, and we will and we will have unique success. I, I love that. It's it, uh, I often think of this quote from a friend of mine, which is if you do the same thing as everybody else, you're going to get the same results as everybody else. So you have to sort of deviate if you want to deviate results, but you need to create an advantageous divergence. You have to not only diverge from what everybody else is doing, but you have to be correct. And and that's extremely difficult. And when you have it, you need to like go all in and, and run with it. A lot of Companies today seem like they have a bit of innovation envy, like they want to be the one to create the iPhone or go zero to one and just create new markets like Facebook or Google. And there's billions and billions of dollars being thrown at these problems in R&D and hiring. And uh, the results don't seem to be super effective. Do you have any thoughts on why? It gets back to what we talked about earlier, Shane, about science, right? Um, Charles Sanders Purse, who's one of the great American pragmatist philosophers with John Dewey and that that uh, uh, era and William James um, pointed out that no new idea in the history of the world has been proven in advance analytically. Now, just think about that for a second. No new idea in the history of the world has been proven in advance analytically. Why? It's linked to what Aristotle said, right? You can't prove something new and different that hasn't happened yet analytically and most innovation processes in the world of big companies right insist on proof before doing something right so this whole notion of like fintech and all this uh, disruption by little little technology firms is all kind of self-induced and, and that comes back to sort of the models that were taught, if you want, in school and the way we look at the world, you come to somebody in an established business and you say, uh, I need to spend, you know, $20 million to prove this idea. And, you know, 50% of the time it's not going to work. And then so you say, no, well, there's no proof that it's going to work because it doesn't fit these models. And then they go and start a startup and you end up acquiring them for like $2 billion five years down the road. 
but you're, you're only seeing the successful results and you're not willing to tolerate the failure internally. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and, and yeah, and, and in some sense, right, the, you know, the enemy, like there's an infinite number of enemy that just keeps pouring over the, over the, you know, your moat, right. And a bunch of them drown in the moat and whatever, but it only takes, it only takes kind of one to get across. Uh, and that's, and that's the problem. So that if, if you have an internal system that makes, that sets up that we won't do anything unless there's proof, right. Then you won't do any of those things and there will be an infinite number of these, uh, these startups. And it's interesting, you know, James March is one of the greatest, I, I think management Love that guy. Uh, think thinkers. Yeah. And he, he wrote about, about the importance of delusion. And then, because okay, he said, uh, um, the economy is underpinned by delusion in, in, in that, uh, we do know that nine out of 10 kind of startups expire with a hundred percent of the, the, uh, resources kind of wasted. If anybody thought those were the odds that they personally were facing, they wouldn't do it, but they, everybody is deluded, self-deluded into thinking they're going to be the one, not the nine. Uh, and because of that, 10 people do try and the economy gets the one success, but it's only because it's only because there's massive amounts of delusion. And so, so, I mean, it is one of the, the cool, uh, the cool things about, about the, the economy is, is, um, all these deluded people, uh, who think they're going to be the one keep trying. And sure enough, that spits out enough successes to change and transform the economy. But I think the big companies sit there with their hands behind the uh, tied behind their back and say, we don't, uh, we don't allow delusional people here. We actually actively try to eliminate them through the hiring process, through the promotion process, through everything. Uh, Absolutely. I, I call that, uh, it's interesting. I think of that as the stormtrooper problem. And we saw this at the intelligence agencies where I used to work and because post Bradley Manning and post Edward Snowden, what they really tightened up was sort of the hiring process. And then to get, Oh, in, really? Ah, well, to get okay. into the agencies and to get a clearance, you sort of like increasingly there's this narrow background you could have, right? You couldn't have, you couldn't have gotten in much trouble. You, you know, you went, generally went to a great school, got good grades. Uh, you didn't sort of stand out in any, you know, crazy way. Um, and so that they view that as interesting. So they view this as the way to reduce security risk. And, and it might in fact be, but the problem is you get these people into an organization, a large organization, then you give them a checklist for promotions. You need to do these 10 things and then you'll get promoted. And then all of a sudden they wake up at 30 and they're given a problem that you can't Google that there's no procedure for that hasn't existed in the world before. And you're told to solve it. And the problem isn't any one particular person. It's the collective because now what happens is the collective group of people in the room look at that problem through very narrow lenses and you're not getting sort of the what I used to call the misfits or the deviants or the the people that aren't necessarily a security risk but might have more of a checkered past because they got in trouble or they did something wrong when they were in high school or uh, and, and once you eliminate those people, you can't creatively problem solve and then you have to buy your problems and I, I think we're witnessing that actually play out with intelligence agencies ah, one that is so fascinating that's fascinating i had no idea but i agree i agree entirely with uh, with uh, your your hypothesis the the way that i think you can see this correct or like see this at like indicators of this being a correct view if it is correct or uh, maybe that it's wrong, but the uh, labor component is going up in intelligence agencies because you're requiring more and more people to solve a very similarly. These are scalable problems, right? These aren't often one-off problems. And then the contracting uh, budget, I bet you, is getting much higher to outsourcing um, to the misfits, to the people that are, are solving the problems. But uh, those would be interesting indicators that that is actually yeah. playing out. Yeah, yeah, no, that is that's fascinating, and it, I mean, it's just such a good example too of of you know it is a complex adaptive system, and and you think you can pull a lever and and just not affect anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, and somehow somehow everything else is going to be exactly exactly what you want. No, you've got to 
You've just got to think these things through. Now, some of them you can't think through and you just have to accept the fact that that different things are going to happen than we think and then be alert to those. But I think you can often you know, kind of think through. Well, often they know what they're doing is probably not going to have the results they want, but it, that it's, it's sort of like doing um, what's defendable versus doing what's right. And uh, especially in politics, you end up doing what's defendable versus what you know is right. Um, because you're, you're never going to fail if you do what's defendable. Yeah. You don't get fired for buying IBM, right? It's that, yeah, that, that's a, that's a big universal thing. Yeah. And that's, again, that comes back to fear, right? If, if you are motivated by fear of being fired, then, then that's, that's, uh, going to happen. I mean, I mean, I remember, I remember, uh, interviewing, A.G. Lafley, you know, the famous CEO of, of, of Proctor, I interviewed him for my work on integ integrative thinking. And, uh, and I remember like one of the things that really sort of propelled his, his uh, career because it was such a big success was going from, I don't know if you remember this, going from big fluffy detergent, a Tide would be in a big box, fluffy detergent to compact uh, detergent, which he saw happening in, in Japan and said, hmm. Well, we wouldn't want them coming here with that innovation, and so so he led he led a a an effort to study whether to introduce it in the in the U.S. and he introduced it despite the fact that the data didn't support it, uh, but the verbatims did. The qualitative stuff uh, kind of uh, was supportive enough, uh, but he he described. The, the, spend, the spending of 200, he got $250 million to do the first thing. And, he, and, and I'll always remember him describing it as a fireable offense. So he knew that if this didn't work, he, he was done because it was a straight up fireable offense. It wasn't, it wasn't a two to one blind, uh, blind uh, uh, winner. Uh, and he wanted to do it uh, anyway. And it turned out to have made them just, I mean, it just was monumentally uh, uh, successful. It, 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 dis, it actually destroyed Unilever's U.S. Uh, position so much that they, they exited. Like it was so monumentally successful that propelled them. But he described it, whatever it was, 20 years later as a fireable offense. He would not have objected to being fired, uh, but, he, but he wasn't. So overwhelmed by the fear of being fired that that uh, uh, that that would have stopped him from from doing it. I love that sort of advantageous divergence, right? Um, let, let's talk a little bit about decision making. What's the most valuable thing that you've learned about decision making that's hard to transfer to other people? I guess I think it is um, patience, giving yourself the time to roll ideas around as long as they need to be rolled around and not feel the the premature need for closure when i'm making a decision imagining a variety of possibilities and not stopping until i have a good divergent set of them then asking about each one of them what would have to be true for that to be a good idea and then asking each element of the things that would have to be true how how likely do i think they are true now if they're not true, how could I, how could I maybe make them true? Uh, you know, it's part of the part of the world where things can be other than they are. So that's sort of a, a, a all those things tend to slow it down. Uh, and it's not as though I want to be have a whole lot of process, but I because you can do it. It doesn't have to have many days elapsed. But I think people often have this this real desire for closure fast, uh, and and I I. I don't, um, though often I surprise people. Like I, I say, if I had, if I had to make this, if I couldn't think anymore, uh, I would do this. And they're like, Oh my God, Roger, you've jumped to that conclusion. I said, I said, you know, sometimes you have to right? sometimes if, if, you know, it was, it was either decide now or, or I shoot you in the head, you decide, you, you, uh, decide, but then I'm still open, you know, tell me, Tell me what about that is is problematic, and let's think about it some more. So I guess I guess that's that's it. Having I I um, I've learned I guess I mean this is a very good question because I hadn't thought about this, but I would I would say that I've learned uh, or taught myself a process of thinking that slows me down enough for me to absorb 
greater variety and greater greater logical pieces. I think of little logical subroutines. A big decision is is stacking together a bunch of logical little subroutines, and and I I have a process for for giving myself time to play around with those. Oh, I could put this one here and this one there, you know, and and that helps me come up with with what people often think of of the things I do as as wow, how do you ever come up with that creative uh, solution, Roger? Well, I kind of slowed down uh, is, is I think the answer. And I mean, I think I, I think I have a decent kind of track record of teaching. If anybody wants to learn it, I can teach people to do that. How do you teach them? How would you teach me? I would just work with you. I, I, I think practices is, is, is the, absolutely the best. And that's what I've gone to with the companies that I work with. I just say, uh, Shane, what's what's a choice that you think you're facing? And you say, oh, I really need to decide whether we're going to invest in this thing or that thing. Uh, I think good, okay. And then I would just I would just work you through through a, a, a process the way I would I would do it, uh, and then and you would learn by uh, doing. Now I'd explain to you why why are we doing this? Why you know you'd say no, Roger, it's either this or this, and I'd say no, it's not. Uh, that's not enough, uh, variety. I want variety. And if you can't come up with variety, that's no problem. Go ask 10 people in the organization and, and, uh, don't stop until you can come back with at least five, six, seven, uh, uh, that include your, uh, that include your, uh, two, but I want another three to, uh, three to five. All right. And, and I'd explain to you why I'd, I'd say you don't have enough raw materials. I don't like either of your choices. Uh, uh, and the reason you haven't made a choice now is because neither of them are that good. If one of them was awesome, you'd have already made the choice. You wouldn't be asking me. So Shane, uh, we need more raw materials. Uh, so go, go get them. And then, then when you come back, I, I teach you how to play with the raw materials, uh, to, to make, uh, to make a better choice. And then hopefully you would the next time without me <laughs> involved in the room, you would have slowed yourself down in a similar, similar way, not thought those are the only two, uh, to go for raw materials to ask these, what if, kind of, what would have to be true type questions. I have a friend, uh, Randall Stutman who gave me vocabulary around how I use, approach decisions on it. And I never had vocabulary around it, but he basically said, you decide as soon as possible or as late as possible, but never in between. And I was always known for sort of deciding at the last moment because I wanted to keep all my options open. And if I didn't have to decide, like, why would I force a decision? I can get more input. I can get more insight into the problem. I can see how the environment's changing and playing out. And I think that plays to the patient's answer that you gave, which I, I think is really an insightful sort of response because so many people just get stuck in the middle. They don't make the decision right away. They'll make it uh, you know, in the middle because they just want to get this sort of Damocles over the, out of their head or they want to stop thinking about it. And it's then when you make these really bad decisions, I think, because you, you've made a premature decision. So you're missing all the input or you're clouding all the input that would come afterwards. And you're only doing it to get rid of it. You're not doing it because you need to make the decision at all. You're just doing it because you don't want to have to think about it again. And there, there's also ways that you can do in your mind where you just sort of like put it down and suppress it, but you're constantly gathering new information about like, am I right? Will this prove me right? Where the, where's the disconfirming evidence that, you know, my hypothesis on this is going to be wrong. And you can see the world through your actions too. So it also allows you to make a decision possibly, but not communicate it, which is you saying, I know what I would do if I had to decide right now. And then you can see the world through those eyes. Had you made that decision, which allows you feedback as well in terms of what that looks like. And I think that that's a really interesting way to frame it. Yeah. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of it that way. That's a good, good insight in some sense. In some sense, when you force yourself to say, this is what I would do if I had to choose now, that's the moral equivalent of putting a prototype out into the market. I hadn't thought of it that, that way because then, then you can then you can say, oh, this happened. That, that would have made mine a clever decision. That happened. Oops. That it wouldn't have been so clever. It's like a, it's like a, a prototype. And when you do that, all the information you receive at that point, you interpret through you having already made that decision, which allows you to see the world in this. You can sort of like take a step through this door and say, what does this look like? 
Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. That's, I mean, that's so powerful because otherwise, because again, you know, people talk about data as if data is sort of this sort of very kind of, you know, I don't know what intrinsic thing it's not data is only data. Uh, like it, it floats straight by your head if you, if, if you're not looking for it. Uh, and what I interpret you saying in part is you will actually create data out of nothingness, right? So stuff you would not have paid attention to and wouldn't have collected as data. You now collect as data because it's, uh, because your choice, your proto choice, uh, your proto choice makes that, that phenomenon relevant uh, data and you collect it and then have the ability to use it that you wouldn't have before because it would have float right by your ear. Uh, that's inter- That's a very interesting uh, uh, thought, Shane. See, I, I learned something from, uh, from this. I'm glad we're chatting. I loved, I've learned a lot too. Uh, I, I want to finish up with one question. I'm experimenting with this question so you, you can tell me your thoughts on it, which is when you're 90, what is it you want people to say about you? Uh, he was a voice that we will miss. Yeah, that's plain and simple. Thank you so much for an amazing conversation, Roger. Thank you. You're awesome at this. Uh, I would happily do this anytime, my friend. We'll do it again sometime, I'm sure. <laughs>